All right, so for the past few weeks, we've been learning a whole bunch about climate science, the scientific basis for understanding climate change. And in this last lesson on climate change, I want to look at the connection between climate science and climate policy. All right, we've got all this great science that tells us all these things about what's happening in the world. How does that connect into actually doing things, actually making policies based on that science. And I want to approach this by talking about the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So in this lesson, we're going to be able to explain what the IPCC is and then examine the role of climate science in policy making and public discourse. So what is the IPCC? So the IPCC was established in 1988 by the World Meteorological Association and the United Nations Environment Program. So we had these two already existing international organizations that dealt with environmental issues and atmospheric issues, and they came together to create the IPCC. It currently has 195 member countries. So different countries around the world, including the United States, are members of the IPCC. It's headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, and it actually won the Nobel Peace Prize back in 2007, along with former U.S. Vice President Al Gore. It's currently chaired by James Ski, who is a energy scientist with a background in physics uh, from Britain. The composition of the IPCC itself is made up of climate scientists who are appointed by those member countries. So they've got those 195 member countries and they can appoint climate scientists from their countries to be part of the IPCC. And when you get appointed to the IPCC, you are acting in this dual or hybrid role. So you are both a subject matter expert, right? So you might be an oceanographer and you have expertise in the, the science of how the ocean works and how it's affected by climate change. But then you're also a representative of your government because your government, you know, the United States or whatever country you're from, put you forward as a representative to be part of the IPCC. So you've got this dual political and uh, scientific kind of role as an IPCC member. So in the latest IPCC report, the big project that they did, the sixth assessment report, involved 234 scientists from 66 different countries. And what they were doing was reviewing the state of climate science. What do we know about climate from all of the scientific research that's been done? And in the case of the sixth assessment report, this involved reviewing over 14,000 scientific papers. So just this wide stretch of the scientific literature about climate change that they had to pull together and synthesize into an understanding of how our climate system works based on our best science that we have available. So that sixth assessment report is obviously the sixth in a series of these major reports that the IPC puts out. This is their biggest project that they do. And these are essentially periodic summaries of the current state of climate science. Uh, and the things to keep in mind about these assessment reports are first that it does not involve original research. So when the IPCC is putting together their assessment reports, they are reviewing and synthesizing the research that's already out there, the things that people have already published, including members of the IPCC themselves have published many of these papers. Um, and they're reviewing and synthesizing this information, but they're not doing additional research as part of the IPCC. They're only taking research that's already been done, already been published, and putting it together. Uh, so they're not doing original research. They're also not making policy recommendations. So obviously a lot of what they have to say is very relevant to policy. It can help policymakers decide whether a proposed policy is going to be effective or not, whether it's going to have certain impacts uh, and unintended consequences and all these things. So it's very relevant to policy, but the IPCC reports themselves do not contain policy recommendations. So you're not going to open the IPCC report and find that they recommend a carbon tax of X dollars per ton or that they recommend, um, you know, reducing, um, coal burning by this amount or something like that. All of those are policy choices. And, you know, you might 
decide to support one policy or another because of the scientific information that you get from something like the IPCC report. It may help you decide whether, you know, a certain carbon tax would work or not um, and whether it would achieve your, your goals. But the IPCC report itself doesn't contain a policy recommendation. It doesn't say this is what governments should do. It also doesn't include recommendations for individuals either. All right, so it doesn't tell you what you should be doing. It doesn't say, hey, you reader, you should buy uh, an electric car instead of a gas car or whatever, you know, thing might be suggested as a way to reduce your personal contribution to climate change. You're not going to find that in the IPCC uh, report. And these, these reports are enormous. These are like thousands of pages long. And you can't, you're not going to expect, you know, senators to sit down and read that whole thing. So they also include what's called a summary for policymakers. So a very short synopsis of what the, the report says. Um, so that's much more digestible for policymakers. And then if they, they're really curious, they could dig into the rest of the report that's there as the, like, the justification of that. Um, and the key thing to remember about the summary for policymakers is that it has to be agreed on by all the member governments. So... All of the governments of the countries that make up the IPCC all have to ha come to consensus on the statements in the summary for policymakers. Um, not in the full report, they're not reviewing the, the entire report, but for the summary for policymakers, there's a political dimension to it where all the governments have to agree on what it says and uh, how it says it. So I've mentioned, again, we have the sixth assessment report, the most recent one, came out in 2021 and 2022. Uh, and it was composed of three main sections, which are referred to as the three working groups. So, so the three groups of scientists working on similar issues that produce each of these three sections. And then there's the synthesis report that puts it all together, that summarizes everything from all three working group reports. So the three working group reports are first the physical science basis. And that's the one I've got the cover of there. And so that's looking at the basic climate science of you know, how much is our climate changing? What human activities are driving that? What are the different radiative forcings that we're dealing with? What are the, you know, processes shaping albedo changes, all those kinds of things. Um, that all goes into the physical science basis report. That's sort of most of what we've done thus far in this class. Working group two is mitigation of climate change. So when we're talking about climate change, we often distinguish mitigation and adaptation. So Mitigation means reducing the amount by which the climate changes. So something like burning less fossil fuels, that would be a mitigation measure because it would reduce the amount of climate change that's going to happen. Adaptation means dealing with the effects of climate change. So the climate has changed. How do we deal with that so that it doesn't uh, cause as much harm to us? And so mitigation versus adaptation, two different things that uh, we can do and Probably need to do both of those to deal with climate change, uh, but they're in separate working groups. So working group two is the mitigation of climate change. What can be done to mitigate climate change and what would the effects of that be? And then working group three is impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. So they're saying, what is climate change going to do to us if it does in fact occur, if we don't mitigate it? Uh, and what are the possibilities for adapting to that? And what is the vulnerability of different places and different communities to that? So we've talked about vulnerability already in this class, right? That um, how much we are hurt by any sort of natural event, such as climate change, is going to depend in part on how our society is set up, or how vulnerable are we to that kind of event. And so working group three is examining vulnerability and looking at why different parts of the world, different communities might be more vulnerable or less vulnerable than others to those various impacts from climate change. So that makes up the main assessment reports. And these come out every five-ish years. The first one was in 1990. And then, of course, we've gotten to number six by uh, 2021 slash 22. Uh, that's the main thing the IPCC is working on. But then there are additional reports that they'll put out along the way as needed on certain specific narrower issues or when there's something that really needs to be updated during that uh, in-between period, right? If it's taking them five, six years to put out the next big report, there might be something they want to update quicker than that. So they put out these additional reports as well. But the these assessment reports are kind of the big uh, output from the IPCC. So the process that produces these reports, 
I've said they've, they're synthesizing literature, right? They're not doing their own original research. They're pulling together research that's already been done and they are drawing primarily on peer reviewed literature. So peer reviewed scientific uh, findings with a lesser role for what's called gray literature. So gray literature means non peer reviewed science. Right? There are things that are of a scientific nature that are published in various outlets that do not go through the peer review process. So the peer review process is kind of the gold standard for reliable scientific results. And so for a paper to be peer reviewed, you, know, you would do your research, you write it up as a paper, you submit it to a journal, and then that journal sends your paper out anonymously to usually three other experts in the field that have not worked with you on this uh, project. They read the paper and they give the journal their assessment. Is this a good paper? Is it a bad paper? What should be fixed about this paper before it gets published? And uh, if the, the reviewers all think that it's a, a paper worth publishing, then their comments will go back to the original authors who have a chance then to fix any of the problems that the reviewers pointed out and resubmit it. The reviewers look at it again, sometimes several rounds of back and forth like that with these reviewers uh, until the reviewers are satisfied with the paper. They, they feel like any flaws in it have been addressed. Um, or the editor of the journal just says, you know, this person's being a jerk, uh, and we're gonna ignore them. Um, and then when that happens, it gets published. And so peer reviewed literature, because it's been reviewed, has been examined by other experts in the field, we can have more confidence in it. Uh, and so the IPCC primarily draws on this peer reviewed literature, but it also incorporates some of this gray literature, which is scientific results that have not gone through the peer review process. So this may be things like reports put out by government departments or by, um, you know, nonprofit or corporate entities that have done some sort of a scientific um, analysis or study or something. Uh, and great literature is important because this is scientific results, right? This can be telling us something about the world, but it also hasn't been through that review process. So we might be a little more wary of that. And in recent uh, years, like for the sixth assessment report, the IPCC has gotten much stingier about using great literature, though they haven't cut it off entirely because of a, um, scandal that came around with the fourth assessment report. So there was a claim in the fourth assessment report that Himalayan glaciers would be gone by 2035. And, you know, this was stated as a, a factual conclusion of the IPCC. But if you traced back where they got that claim from, it turned out it claim, came from a interview with a glaciologist in New Scientist, which is a, a reputable scientific magazine, but it's not a peer reviewed um, journal. And this glaciologist was just giving his opinion about how fast he thought uh, glaciers in the Himalayas were, were melting. And this ended up making its way into the fourth assessment report. And it became this sort of scandal called Glacier Gate when uh, it started to get news coverage. And in response to that, the IPCC has really dialed back the degree to which they will use gray literature or, you know, include findings that aren't from the peer reviewed literature into their assessment reports. So each section of the report, right, because it's three working groups, is written by a team of authors who are all scientific experts in that area of climate science, and then it's reviewed by other experts and political representatives. So the IPCC report itself goes through a kind of peer review process. You've got the authors, and then you've got reviewers also looking at the report, pointing out things that they see as potential problems with it, and you know, going back and forth to try to work those issues out. This is a very lengthy process, right? To go from a new scientific finding being discovered to the point where it can get into the IPCC assessment report, right? Because it has to first go through the peer review process, which in most cases, uh, which is uh, usually a very lengthy process. Uh, it sometimes takes years to get uh, your paper published in a peer reviewed journal. And then the IPCC has to get it and go through its whole process. Um, so it's a very lengthy process, many years for a, uh, scientific finding to make it into the IPCC report. Plus, there's this need for consensus. All the authors working on the report need to be in agreement about everything that goes into it. So between those two things, the conclusions that make it into the IPCC report tend to be very conservative. So they're not going out on a limb. They're not endorsing, you know, cutting edge theories or brand new results that haven't been well backed up because 
you know, those either haven't made it through the, this whole pipeline to get there in the first place, or, you know, somebody's going to say, ah, I don't know about that one, and, and it'll get kicked out because they can't find consensus about it. So the conclusions that are in the IPCC report tend to be very conservative, tend to be sort of least common denominator agreements rather than, you know, out on a limb, cutting edge kind of claims that you might find if you went to that peer-reviewed literature or, or especially the gray literature and started looking up the, uh, the original claims that people are, are making. So we've got all these claims going into the IPCC report and very few things in climate science are 100% certain, right? are like indisputable, complete uh, facts. So instead, when the IPCC reports make a claim, they assign a level of certainty to it. They tell us how certain are they that this is true, that this thing they say is going to happen will actually happen, right? So they tell us that we expect sea level to rise by, you know, X meters in a certain time frame. How certain are we that that is true? Is that a, a guess? Is that very definite? Um, and in the report, they use this uh, set of terminology to describe certainty. So they might describe something as virtually certain, very likely, likely, about as likely as not, unlikely, very unlikely, exceptionally unlikely. And that is so that somebody just, you know, average person reading that will get a good sense of how sure they are about different claims. Because when you hear someone say something is very likely, you know, you know, okay, that's probably true, but not guaranteed. And then somebody says, but this other thing is very certain. You know, you're like, oh, that's a more reliable claim. That's something that they uh, have more confidence in if you're using this kind of sort of everyday language. But each of these terms is actually defined mathematically. So if the IPCC report says something is virtually certain, then that means they have estimated that there's a, at least a 99% chance that that is true. If they say it is very likely, that means they've estimated there's at least a 90% chance that that's true. So each of these sets of words that gives us as the you know average person reading it a, a sense of their level of certainty actually has a mathematical definition behind it. And that, that mathematical definition is in turn based on our scientific results, right? When we do these, uh, you know, run these climate models and do other kinds of studies, uh, we get ranges of uncertainty around our uh, around our results, and that feeds into using this terminology to describe the level of certainty or uncertainty to various claims. And it's actually very interesting if you look at the assessment reports over the years to trace how certain claims have shifted in the amount of certainty that the authors have about them at different points in time. And most of the time what we see is that claims that were relate, rated, you know, maybe likely in say the third assessment report by the time we get to the sixth are now very likely or virtually certain uh, because our knowledge about climate has improved over that time period. So they're able to take the same claim that, you know, they said maybe it was likely in the past and now they're able to have much more confidence in making that claim today. But maybe there's new claims that they're adding in that we're still not quite as certain about yet. And maybe in a future report that that claim will go up the, the ladder to being uh, more certain. Or sometimes claims go down the ladder, right? Sometimes there's something that we thought was probably true in the past and now additional research has shown us that that's actually not, uh, not very likely to be true. So they, they can go either way. More often, you tend to see things becoming more certain over time as you look at the different uh, assessment reports over time. So that's the IPCC at the international level, right? And 195 countries getting together to summarize the state of climate change science. We also have a national climate assessment in the United States. So the U.S. government produces its own climate change, climate science synthesis report uh, that is intended to be more relevant to policymaking here in the United States. So this is called the National Climate Assessment. It's actually mandated by a law that was passed in 1990 called the Global Change Research Act. So this act of Congress mandated that every four years, the federal government has to put out this national climate assessment summarizing the state of climate science as it's relevant to the United States so that that can then be a basis for policy making by both by Congress and by the executive branch. They can, you know, draw on the scientific information from this fifth national climate assessment that just came out or the previous ones um, 
rather than themselves having to go to the uh, scientific literature and like read all these papers themselves, right? Which they're generally too busy to be reading all of those papers themselves. They have to rely on these uh, assessment reports that bring it all together. So the National Climate Assessment in the United States is produced by the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which is composed of scientists from 14 different federal agencies. Um, and it comes together under the office of the president to work on this report. So this is sort of government wide. All of the federal agencies whose work relates in any way to something that might be affected by climate change. So this includes obviously things like uh, you know, the Department of Agriculture and the EPA. It also includes things like the Department of Homeland Security in the Department of Defense because their activities, right, their national security and, and defense and stuff, that's affected by climate change. And so they're involved in the creation of these reports. So the fifth National Climate Assessment was released in 2023 and, um, you know, sort of updated our understanding of climate science. Uh, and it was notable for its emphasis on collaboration with indigenous communities. So that's something that uh, has become a, a bigger priority for the federal government to uh, work not just with sort of the, the general public of the United States, but with the specific needs and specific situations of indigenous communities and the knowledge that indigenous communities have about their lands and the places that they live and the observations that they've been able to make over you know, many, many generations of life and the environment in the places that, uh, that they live. So that's summarizing the science. What are policymakers going to do with this? Well, they're going to try to make policy. They're going to pass laws that are aimed at, uh, you know, mitigating or adapting to climate change. And the big framework under which a lot of this policymaking happens is the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So the UNFCCC is a treaty that was signed in 1992 at the so-called Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. So uh, the United Nations called this giant conference about the environment in 92 in Rio, and the big product of this conference was this treaty to establish a framework for international policymaking on climate change. So the UNFCCC does not obligate countries to do anything about climate change. It just creates the system by which they will make agreements about what exactly to do. Right, so the UNFCCC just creates this uh, governing framework. You can think of it as kind of the constitution for international climate change policy. And then working within that framework, countries are are trying to figure out a set of actual policies that make specific commitments to what are different countries going to do about climate change. And they do that at an annual-ish conference of the parties, uh, which rotates among different world regions. So it's held in different cities every year. Uh, so the recent ones, COP27, this 27th conference of the parties, uh, was held in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt in November of 2022. We've got COP28 in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates coming up uh, just in the future as I'm recording this video, November, November, December 2023. And then COP29, they still haven't picked out, uh, as I'm recording this, they still haven't picked out the exact city. It'll be somewhere in Eastern Europe uh, in November 2024. So we're having this roughly every year. All of the countries that are part of the UNFCCC get together and try to negotiate a more specific agreement about what to do about climate change. So one of the most famous such agreements came out of the meeting in 1997 in Kyoto, Japan, where we have the Kyoto Protocol. So this was an agreement that set specific targets for countries to try to achieve in terms of mitigating climate change. And it really emphasized the need for richer countries who had more money and had, were producing more greenhouse gases to be the ones to really make big cuts to their uh, greenhouse gases. So the Kyoto Protocol was kind of the big thing for uh, quite a long time. It eventually expired in 2012. So the uh, sets of numbers that they had come up with of, you know, what kind of greenhouse gas reductions does each country that signs on to it have to make those tables of numbers expired in 2012. And the United States never signed on to the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, so 
the, the U.S. Congress said that because the Kyoto Protocol only mandated greenhouse gas cuts by rich countries like the United States, uh, but didn't mandate those cuts for poorer countries, even very large ones like India or China, the United States uh, Senate that would have to ratify the Kyoto Protocol for it to become legally binding on this country uh, said no to it and continued to say no to it under both Democratic and Republican presidents until the it became a moot point uh, when the Kyoto Protocol expired. In 2015, we had the meeting in Paris, France, and they agreed on the Paris Accord, which was sort of a successor agreement to Kyoto. Uh, and it was structured a little bit differently. So it involved a set of voluntary pledges by countries. So rather than the binding targets that Kyoto had, there were voluntary pledges by countries. Uh, and their target in setting these pledges was to keep the warming of the earth ideally below 1.5 degrees Celsius of um, temperature anomaly globally and definitely below 2 degrees Celsius temperature anomaly. And in your exercise from last week, you were looking at these Paris targets. You were looking at the pledges countries had made under the Paris Accord uh, and seeing what that would actually produce, you know, do the pledges that have been made add up to enough mitigation to hit that target? And I think the conclusion that uh, you hopefully came to and which various other uh, reports have come to is that the existing pledges under the Paris Accord uh, are good, but not good enough. They don't get us to that target that the countries agreed to in the Paris Accord. Now, the United States did join the Paris Accord. Then we tried to back out of it during uh, Donald Trump's presidency, uh, and then we went back into it when Joe Biden became president. So the Paris Accord does apply to the United States, but as I said, the pledges for reducing greenhouse gas emissions under the Paris Accord are all voluntary. So if the United States were to do nothing, um, you know, it would look bad, but we wouldn't be like legally liable. Uh, you know, we wouldn't be breaking the treaty uh, in any way, and likewise for any other other country. So we've got the Paris Accord, and then subsequent conferences of the parties have aimed to update, to strengthen the Paris Accord, and in particular, one of the big issues on the table right now, and that's going to be one of the big issues discussed in Dubai, is what's called loss and damage. So we know at this point we are committed to uh, a certain amount of warming. Right. We are, are well past the, the point at which we could stop any uh, significant climate change from happening uh, at all. And even if we hit these Paris targets of 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius, that's still going to do a lot of damage to a lot of people around the world, and in particularly in poorer countries, uh, are expected to be hit pretty hard by some of the effects of climate change. And so the idea of the loss and damage fund is that rich countries would put forward money that would then be used to help poorer countries to uh, engage in adaptation, things that would prevent that damage from happening to them, or to repair and get back on their feet after uh, the damage has already happened. And so that, that remains one of the big issues of, of contention is how should this be set up? What kind of pledges should richer countries make to it, et cetera? So in your lab assignment for this week, you're going to be examining the IPCC reports and how they synthesize climate science and evaluating the use of that climate science to make policy about climate change.